Multiple pregnancies lower the risk of breast cancer. One pregnancy transiently increases the risk and then it comes down as time goes by. And no pregnancies are associated with a slightly higher risk of developing breast cancer. I wasn't actually aware of the epidemiologic studies in the uh, early parts of the um, 20th century that identified nuns as higher risk. I, I'm very familiar with the work on scrotal cancer and chimney sweeps. The hazard ratios there were alarmingly high. I mean, they were, you know, hazard ratios of four and five, six. I mean, these were, there was, it was very easy to make the causal link. Do you know how high the hazard ratios were for nuns versus non-nuns? To in be breast honest, cancer? I'm not sure they even articulated as um, hazard ratios back in the day. And just to be clear for your audience, I wasn't there when these studies <laughs> were being done. You know, it was seen that, you know, these nuns were, were at a greater risk of developing breast cancer. And then this, again, we're talking about a time that predates radiology. One of the reasons you could do epidemiology on scrotal tumors or breast tumors is because you could see the cancer. Right. And in fact, breast cancer was known to the ancients. Uh, it is described in uh, Hippocratic type writings and um, uh, other sort of uh, documents from antiquity. And it was the one cancer that would commonly be visually seen. People undoubtedly had other kinds of cancers in the era, but in a time before you had imaging, um, there were rather few that you would actually visually encounter. So uh, breast cancer is a very ancient disease in that respect. And it was one of these things that people appreciated that uh, for whatever reason, nuns were uh, at greater risk. Nowadays, we would say it's because of um, the fact that they were not pregnant and were not nursing and all those kinds of things, which clearly change uh, the risk. The, the interaction between pregnancy and breast cancer risk is both very interesting and, and complicated. So multiple pregnancies lower the risk of breast cancer. One pregnancy trans transiently increases the risk and then it comes down as time goes by. And no pregnancies are associated with a slightly higher risk of developing uh, breast cancer. And that's not related to the uh, in vitro fertilization or other hormonal supplements. They've looked at that with a lot of rigor in the particularly the Scandinavian databases where they have outstanding public health registries of, of all the patients in the Scandinavian countries. And it's so infertility, for instance, is a slight risk for breast cancer, but um, the treatments for infertility per se are not. Now, the other thing, and I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but the other thing to say is when we talk about increased risk, there's a huge difference between a population increased risk and the risk for a given patient. So at the outset, we said one in eight lifetime risk in the United States, that's 12, 13 percent. A woman who has um, early onset of uh, menarche menstruation or hormone replacement therapy uh, such that they have longer estrogen exposure or shorter period of nursing or shorter, uh, uh, fewer pregnancies, they might have a 25 or 30 percent greater risk of breast cancer. But that only moves the needle from around 12 percent to around 15 percent. So, you know, the risk I I at the population level is big. The risk for an individual is still pretty small for these kinds of factors. And do we have a sense of the difference between things that drive the increase in risk versus things that drive an increase in mortality? So, for example, in prostate cancer, uh, it's generally well understood that the prevalence of prostate cancer approximates the decade of life of the male. So a guy in his 50, you know, basically half of men in their 50s have some prostate cancer, you know, Gleason 3 plus 3, and this is not a prostate cancer you would take out, but on autopsy, you would find it. And this goes on, right? By the time a guy is in his 70s, you might expect that 70, there's a 70% 70 chance he has prostate cancer. And of course, the challenge then of the urologist is understanding which man is going to die from versus with prostate cancer. A moment ago, you gave the example of hormone replacement therapy. And of course, that's a topic we've covered in such alarming detail here that it needs no further rehashing. But the, the punchline is, while the Women's Health Initiative demonstrated that women taking conjugated equine estrogen plus MPA had a 25% increase in the risk of breast cancer, it never translated to an increase in mortality. Um, and similarly, the woman who took conjugated equine estrogen alone saw 24% decrease in, uh, in breast cancer. So um, my point there being, do we have a sense of which risk factors are driving mortality versus just incidents? No and yes. Uh, so there, again, population level, The uh, this gets us into the subsets of the different cancers that we speak about. Mm -hmm. So there are really three major flavors of breast cancer. There is estrogen receptor positive, so-called HER2 or HER2 negative breast cancers. And those are the most prevalent kinds of breast cancer. Um, they account for 70 to 75 percent, if not more, of all breast cancers. They are the tumors most likely to be found on screening mammography as opposed to presenting with a lump in the breast. They tend to have 
ounce for ounce, size for size, the most favorable prognosis in most but not all instances. And um, they peak in incidence at around age 65 in the United States. So that is the sort of public health face of a lot of breast cancer. But there are other types of breast cancer as well, presumably which have some different epidemiologic risk factors, and those include what's called triple negative breast cancer, which is lacking estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and HER2, hence triple negative. Um, those tumors have an earlier onset, are more common in younger women, are more common at the population level in African-American women, are less likely to be the kind detected on a screening mammogram as opposed to a clinical finding, and um, are a riskier flavor of breast cancer. And similarly, HER2-positive breast cancers, which were tumors that have an amplification of the HER2 new oncogene and account for about 10 to 15 percent of all breast cancers. Those tumors were classically described in younger women. And uh, again, there's the, the epidemiology of HER2-positive breast cancer as opposed to ER-positive breast cancer is not really well described. So in general, older women are more likely to have better prognosis breast cancers at diagnosis because of the subset that arises in them. And younger women uh, tend to have more aggressive flavors of breast cancer again, in, in broad strokes. Hal, I want to go over that again, because I think that's just a fantastic overview of basically the three subtypes. I also want to point out that you did not talk about uh, progesterone receptor, except in the negative when you talked about the triple negative case. Let's go back. Case one is, I'm assuming it's ER positive, PR agnostic, HER2, new, HER2 negative, correct? That's correct, though the vast, vast majority of those tumors also express progesterone receptor. Got it. You made the case again. These are the ones that are showing up more likely on mammography. They're also showing up in older women, median age, I think you said about 65. Yeah, you'll reasonably see those across the whole yeah. age spectrum, but the peak is that's at the 65, peak. and um, that's correct. Yep. Obviously, we're going to dive into the therapeutic options, prognoses, exam, et cetera. Yeah. You then talked about triple negative, though you didn't give a, uh, a distribution or a number on that. I'm just doing the math in my head. That seems to be about 10 to 15 percent of the population. Correct. Yep. Okay. So 10 to 15 percent are triple negative. Again, that's ER negative, PR negative, HER2 new negative. These right. skew younger. These skew more. They skew younger. They, again, you can see them anywhere. Uh, yep. I see 80 year olds who have triple negative breast cancer, but um, mm -hmm. they tend to skew younger. Um, there is an interesting relationship between race and triple negative breast cancer, and there's been a lot of really excellent studies to suggest that there may be some um, real demographic genetic differences that predispose. We tend to see triple negative breast cancers also in BRCA1 mutation carrier, so there's a clear link between specific genetic syndromes, such as BRCA and triple negative disease, but they also tend to be more virulent, so they're more likely to present as a lump in the breast or a physical exam finding as opposed to readily being identified on a screening mammogram. You mentioned a higher prevalence in African-American. Where do Asian women fit into this? Do they skew to any more any, any more than others? They, they don't have any enrichment in general over the normal okay. distribution. Or not the normal, but and the, then the U.S. The distribution. And then the last one you talked about was all the HER2 new positives, which includes your triple positives and, frankly, agnostic of ERPR, but HER2 new positive. Correct. And that's collectively about 15% of all breast cancers split half and half between those that are ER positive, HER2 positive, and... ER negative and HER2 positive. So again, that includes all of your triple positives. And is the distinction there a biologic one, Hal, or are you making that distinction more because of Herceptin? Uh, I, I guess I should just clarify for the listener, because that because there's a targeted therapy for the HER2 new receptor positive cancer. Yeah, so you, you, you're you exactly right. So trastuzumab or Herceptin is the target of therapy, and that has been sort of the revolutionary treatment in the uh, management of HER2 positive tumors. So there is a both a biological difference. There is a specific region of the chromosome 17 that's amplified, giving overexpression of the HER2 new oncogene that's presumably a driver for a fraction of these breast cancers. Um, but it's also very important because it allows us to bring a specific targeted therapy to play. Thank you.